Antibiotics have been used since ancient times, but it wasn't until penicillin was discovered that we fully understood how they could be produced to fight bacterial infections. So effective are these antimicrobials that farmers now use them regularly when la raising livestock. But what effect can that have on consumers? We'll learn more next on Show Me Egg. Welcome to Show Me Ag, I'm your host Kyle Vickers. It's generally accepted that the overuse of antibiotics in food producing animals might lead to resistant pathogens, which can then lead to antibiotic resistant infections in humans. With that in mind, the Food and Drug Administration is making an effort to promote the judicious use of antimicrobials in food producing animals. The FDA, FDA's new veterinary feed directive will require authorization by a veterinarian before antibiotics can be administered to livestock. To learn more, our guest this evening is Craig Payne, the Dr. Craig Payne, I should say, the director of the MU College of Veterinary Medicine's Department of Extension and Continuing Education. Uh, Dr. Payne, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. As I've introduced this, you know, I want you to correct me on anything that I'm misunderstanding. It's the Veterinary Feed Directive, uh, VFD, we'll, we can refer to it, is new starting January 1st. So tell us a little bit about the background and how this came about. So back in 96, the FDA only had two ways in which to classify uh, drugs that were going to be used in livestock. One was either over-the-counter medications or the other one was through prescription status. And so with that, um, there were some feed additives, uh, medications that were coming out on the market that the FDA needed a different classification for. So that is the point in which this veterinary feed directive or veterinary drug status, veterinary feed directive drug status uh, was started at. And so there's already a current, there's currently three VFD drugs out on the marketplace. Uh, but what's going to happen at the end of this year, beginning of next year, is we're going to see this transition of a lot of uh, products that have been used in the feed in the past that are antibiotics that they're going to move from over-the-counter availability to this veterinary feed directive status. Am I right that this is kind of comes out of a concern of antibiotic resistance? For the most part and uh, you know as FDA has released some of their guidance for industry documents related to these changes that are coming they mention that uh, part of this activity is try to reduce the probability that there may be antibiotic resistance uh, that spills over into the human population. And, and how exactly does that work? Can you explain a little bit of what kind of what that process is? Well, essentially, um, the, the thought process is that if we're using antibiotics on the farm on a regular basis, could we be creating an antibiotic resistant organism that gets into the food supply or shed into the environment and then uh, people consume that organism or are exposed to it? And now they develop that now they have an antibiotic resistant bacteria and the antibiotics the uh, medical doctors are prescribing aren't effective because that's an antibiotic resistant bug we create in the livestock industry. Now with that being said, although that's the theory that uh, the FDA is working off of, as well as other countries as they have made these antibiotic label changes, um, you know, meetings I have been in related to this subject it's very difficult to find any conclusive evidence that that t entire sequence of events has ever occurred. But nonetheless, we're doing this under what is called the precautionary principle, and that's just trying to avoid this from happening in the first place, even though we don't have conclusive evidence that um, it could be problematic or is problematic. So it's not a direct line from uh, uh, use of antibiotics and livestock feed to resistance in my son's hearing or ear infection. Right, we know, that there, we know that there's, you know, if we're using antibiotics in a livestock operation on a continual basis, that we can drive resistance in that operation. And of course, we also know that there's antibiotic resistant organisms in the human population. Where the lack of evidence at this point is, uh, is, is making that connection, that spread through the food system or other methods into the human population. So the, the result or the end result, I guess, starting 1st of January is that we're going to, if we want to feed uh, antibiotics in feed or water, we're going to have to go to a veterinarian uh, to make, uh, that's the first step. Correct, correct. And so if, if it's a feed grade antibiotic, and let me back up and say that um, the FDA has a list of antibiotics that they consider medically important in human medicine. And it is those antibiotics that are going to be impacted by these changes. And so these antibiotics, we're not talking about injectable over-the-counter products at this point, such as LA-200 or penicillin. 
So this is only going to impact those feed grade and water soluble antibiotics. So with that, um, if it's a feed grade antibiotic and it's medically important and a producer is wanting to obtain and use that product, they're going to need to get a veterinary feed directive from their veterinarian to do that. If it's one of these medically important water soluble antibiotics, they're going to need to get a prescription from their veterinarian to use those products on their farm. And I want to emphasize the injectable antibiotics that we typically give to an individual sick animal, uh, those are not affected by this rule. Right. So, you know, we've already got some prescription injectable medications out there. Um, uh, but the one that most people are concerned about is I've done meetings around the state and elsewhere. Uh, they always ask about those over-the-counter injectables such as LA-200 or penicillin, and no, they will not be impacted by these changes at this point in time. Yeah, I think the other thing that we need to emphasize, that the veterinarian can't just, uh, you, you can't call up on the phone and, and get a veterinarian to do this. This is something, this, this pres prescription or this directive, uh, really the veterinarian has to have a relationship with the client and the animal. Right, so that is what is called a veterinary client-patient relationship. And even today when a producer needs a prescription injectable medication to treat their livestock, a veterinarian has to have a VCPR in place with that producer in order to write that prescription. Same thing will apply with these VFDs in that there has to be that relationship between the veterinarian and producer, which basically means the veterinarian needs to be acquainted with the care and the keeping of the animals. And that's going to require at times a farm visit. And so uh, for producers that, you know, use a veterinarian on a regular basis, there's probably not going to be anything additional they need to do. On the other hand, for those producers that don't use a veterinarian on a regular basis, they probably need to get with a veterinarian if they plan on continuing to use these uh, drugs at the beginning of next year see what it's going to take to get that VCPR established and what it's going to take to keep that VCPR going throughout the years. I want to come back in a minute and talk a little bit more about some of these details and what products are affected, but the next step is that the feed store, feed company, where the farmer buys has got to have that notification, and the state's going to make some regulations about this or, or continue to regulate it. So to get a perspective from someone else directly affected by the new VFD, we recently visited MFA Agri Services in California. They, along with the Missouri Department of Agriculture and are anticipating the implementation of the new rules and spreading the word to their customers. The changes that are going to take place with the drugs that we're currently manufacturing in the feeds uh, starting January 1st those drugs are going to be restricted unless you have a VFD and a VFD is a veterinary feed directive. So the farmer would go to the veterinarian that he has a client relationship with. He would then uh, tell the veterinarian what animals he has, what amount of time he's going to be feeding the feed, and what is the problem that he thinks he needs to be treating. And then that VFD will come to the feed store, we will double check everything, and then allow that customer to buy the feed that has that drug in there. That's different than it is now because for many of these drugs, the farmer can now just come in, purchase that drug, or the feed that has that drug in there. So that in itself is going to be a a lot different way of doing business for us and the farmer and the veterinarian. I think some of the producers won't be using as much of the drugs because there are times in which they're used as a preventative. They're not actually treating a sick animal. They're preventing an animal from getting sick. Some of that will go away. The others will go ahead and go through the steps that they're going to be required to, to get the drugs put in their feed and, and we'll follow the right protocols to where it won't be, they'll still be getting the same feed that they've always gotten, they've just got to do a couple extra steps. FDA's new mantra now is educate then regulate. Uh, we like to think that in the state of Missouri we've done that uh, all along. Uh, we really do try to work hard with our firms to make sure that, that they're in compliance with state laws. We just want everybody to play by the same set of rules. So we've worked hard Man, over the last couple of years because we knew this was coming. 
uh, to try to make sure that feed mills were aware that uh, that these that this rule was coming into play. Um, and you know we're going to do what we've been doing all along, and that's try to make sure that that our firms and our folks uh, know what the rule is and uh, know how to get in compliance. Us as the feed mills have to keep this paperwork for for either two or three years, uh, so it can be traced back. The veterinarian has to keep that same paperwork, and then the producer has to keep paperwork for two years. So we're adding a whole lot of extra steps in a situation that we've never had to do that before. So that will certainly be the biggest challenge is keeping the record straight, making sure that everything is followed as the VFD states um, because it's set for a certain time period. So that's probably going to be the hardest part if a customer comes in at the last day when that VFD is coming due and he's ready to pick up all of his feed. Uh, typically I'm wanting to sell product to people and on a deal like this I'm going to have to not sell that product to that person because he won't be able to use all of that feed in the set period of time that the VFD states. So that's going to be the hardest part for us is uh, getting a guy in the door wanting to do business with us and then we sending him back out without what he wants. So that, that's going to be the, a difficult thing to talk through and, and explain. I think feed mills are, are fairly aware of what's going to happen. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think the message out to the more general public uh, and um, it's, it's probably not been uh, as good, although we've worked pretty darn hard to do it. Um, I know that the uh, veterinarians, uh, the state veterinarians are ha having several meetings right now to help veterinarians understand the directive, uh, the feed directive, and understand how to make a legal one, um, and understand what's going to be involved. Um, but certainly among, among uh, uh, you know, th those who are purchasing feed, currently feeds with drugs in them, um, the knowledge out there may not be as great. And, and so, so this may be a, sh a shock to some folks. All of what I've heard from the farmers have been negative. They do not want to add any more levels of bureaucracy, any more paperwork or any more regulation onto the industry or onto themselves. Uh, they didn't feel that it's an issue the way we've been handling things, um, but I'm sure they will adapt and in another five, six years it probably won't be near the issue as, as it is right now. Use of drugs is is uh, uh, it's an important it's important in animal agriculture. From time to time, animals get sick and they need to be treated, and these drugs do a good job of that. And and we, we certainly need to hang on to them in the, in in agriculture. But we do need to use them judiciously. We need to be uh, uh, we need to be careful with their use uh, and not use them indiscriminately and and use them too much. And that's the, that's the purpose of the rule. We want a, a strong, safe agriculture um, and produce a good product. And, uh, you know, we can do that. Well, Dr. Payne, this brings up a, a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to, to take them. But the first, uh, my first impression is that there's been a lot of work done to advise the people that are involved here, farmers, veterinarians, feed companies. There's been a lot of groundwork laid to be sure that people are in compliance. Sure, and there's, that's kind of been a, a multi-cast uh, effort with, with people and involved at various levels trying to get the word out. With that being said, I, despite how many meetings I have done or other people in the state have done, there's still going to be those that um, aren't aware that these changes have happened. And when they go into their feed store next year, you know, they're going to they're, they're, they're gonna be uh, surprised by being told that they need a VFD now to get some of these drugs. One question that I want to explain, Mr. McDowell mentioned, uh, I believe he said therapeutic versus subtherapeutic. Can you explain a little bit about this is, uh, and how this is going to be applied? Sure. So um, one of the major changes associated with these antibiotic label changes is that 
any type of medically important feed grade or water soluble that has a production claim on the label. So that would be, be something like increased rate of gain or improved feed efficiency. That indication is considered subtherapeutic, and so it's going to be removed from the label from those products, and it will no longer be permissible to use them uh, for those purposes. Now, um, as long as those antibiotics have other indications for treatment, prevention, or control of disease, they'll still be uh, available on the market for that. They'll just produce your need of VFD to get those drugs at that point. So in uh, thinking about my own operation, we typically feed some antibiotic and st or starter feeds when we wean kids because they're under some stress. And then uh, again, in, in minerals at certain times of the year to, to uh, well, for instance, to deal with anaplasmosis in the, sure. in the fall is something. How, how would that work? If, I, if I'm typically look at my records and see that that's what I'm doing in the past, how will my life change? Well, you'll, you'll, you'll still be able to get uh, those antimicrobials for those certain disease claims. So control of anaplasmosis would be one example or control and treatment of pneumonia would be another. Uh, just the extra a step that you'll have to take now is to get a VFD from your veterinarian to use those drugs for those purposes. So I'll go, I'll go talk to him, tell him what we're using. He's typically out of my farm several times a year, so that's probably going to be enough to, for him to, uh, to have that relationship. Uh, and, and so he's going to write this uh, VFD for me. Correct. And, and so it's kind of their judgment call as to whether that product is the right product or the right drug for the circumstance that you're dealing with. And so if they determine that it is, then they'll um, issue a VFD for that drug. And that then will be sent to the people that I tell him that I might be buying feed from. They'll have to keep uh, that on file. Right, right. So after that veterinarian um, writes the VFD, if they're issuing it electronically, they'll be sending it directly to the feed distributor, and then they'll get your copy as well. If they're doing this in hard copy, they can give you both of those copies. You can take one to the distributor and you keep the other one on file. And so, as was already said in, in the little segment there, is that everybody's required to keep a copy of this VFD on file for two years after the date it was issued. Uh, the, we had uh, Stan Cook from the Missouri Department of Agriculture, and I think they have a great reputation of of not a heavy-handed regulation. They're gonna have a role because they're gonna do some spot checks, not necessarily with the farmer, but with the feed stores? Well, we're still waiting for the FDA to really give us clarification on what the inspection process is gonna look like. They've maybe given us a glimpse, um, but I'm not comfortable enough with what they have rolled out so far to go into detail on what that uh, involves. And as I understand it, this is uh, food animals only, so uh, people with companion animals, that's not gonna be an issue. Well, so this is this is one thing that uh, I try to get veterinarians and, and all animal owners to understand, and that is what is going on here is labels are being changed, and so if it's a feed grade antibiotic, it's gonna say federal law requires the use by or on the order of a licensed veterinarian. Same thing that goes with these water-soluble products. When that wording changes, that now becomes law, and so it doesn't matter what species those products are being used in, they're gonna need to get a VFD if it's a feed grade antibiotic or a prescription if it's water soluble. So it could impact uh, companion animals, uh, people that might be feeding antibiotics or something to their horses for some treatment. Right, so you know, the, the question that kinda um, catches everybody off guard comes from beekeepers. Uh, they use water-soluble oxytetracycline in their beehives to control a larval disease, and they're going to need a prescription to get those water-soluble products to use in their beehives, even though technically bees aren't considered livestock, mm -hmm. and, and that's because the label has changed. So this could impact you know, small animal, large animal, mixed animal veterinarians, it can impact all sorts of different kind of animals. A lot of, uh, lots and lots of small poultry producers these days, right. people raising homegrown eggs and that sort of thing, that's, uh, will that be an impact on them? Yeah, so if they're, if they're gonna be using one of these medically important antibiotics, yes, it will impact them. Well, let's talk a little bit about, this. let's try to get specific on, I know, for instance, rumensin is a growth promoting cattle, I believe we can still feed that. So there's some things that we can still add, some things that are gonna be a, a part of this VFD. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, so an important point to note about the ionophores such as rumensin is even though the FDA considers them an antimicrobial, they're not medically important. So they will still have those production claims on the label and you will be able to use those for improved feed efficiency. Now with that being said, um, there are approved combination feed additives that the FDA has. We all know what chlorotetracycline is, we all know what rumensin is. In beef cattle, that is not an approved combination to be fed together. 
And so when this all goes into effect, some of these practices that people have done in the past, not knowing there's a not an approved combination, they're going to find out that they're going to have to find some other ionophore to put in with that chlorotetracycline. So what kinds of, well, can you kind of name off the antibiotics that we might recognize that are prohibited or, or come under Affected. the directive? Yeah. So um, AS700 is, is one that uh, I get quite a few questions about. Your chlorotetracyclines, and most people know it by the trade name of oreomycin. Um, that's another product that will be affected. Um, the Tylen products, any type of water-soluble penicillin product, uh, the list goes on and on. So there's very few of these true antibiotics that are not going to be impacted by these changes. So um, I assume the veterinarians are, are more aware of this than anybody, or do you think that they're still lagging behind the curve? Because typically they're pretty darn busy. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, I, I sense a level of discomfort in, uh, in them trying to fill out VFT, such as the reason where I um, here starting next weekend, October 30th, we're going to start a series of um, training events around the state to get veterinarians more comfortable with filling out VFTs and doing it accurately. So are, um, are, do you think they're familiar? Are they going to be charging for this service? Or is that going to be typically a part of their regular services with the client? That's a good question. And every meeting I ever do, that's a, that's a question that comes up from producers. And honestly, I don't have an answer at this point in time because veterinarians haven't established um, or not talking about it at least. It's too early for them. Right. They're going to have to figure this out pretty quick. Right, <laughs> they, are. they are. And what about the, will this make the feed additives more expensive, do you think? Will there be additional expense for the uh, feed companies that are... Involved. You know, most uh, meetings that I've been in with feed distributors, uh, they don't anticipate any or a significant, at least, they don't expect a significant price increase. Some will say we're not going to increase the price whatsoever. So that would be one of those uh, situations that a producer would need to talk with their feed distributor about. Seems pretty minimal in, in terms of what they're uh, being asked to do, just a, an additional record keeping for them, which is not uh, not easy, but not uh, a genuine uh, big expense. Right, and and probably you know the 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 biggest hurdle is there's still things about this process that we don't know yet, and we're not going to know until we get into it next year. And so there's going to be a large learning curve for everybody involved in this initially. Five years down the road, after we've done this several years, it's not probably going to be that big a deal. But in the initial phase, It'll kind of be normal yeah. course of action after a while. Right. 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 Well, what about the larger operations, the the big poultry and and uh, hog operations that are uh, particularly in Missouri? Will this have a big impact on them? Well, you know, they are probably uh, more ahead of the curve than most people. A lot of those have staff veterinarians, and so. They've no doubt been uh, working on this for quite a while, and maybe some of them have been using, especially in the swine industry, VFD drugs in the past. And so um, I don't expect it to have as big of an effect on them as producers that just aren't accustomed to this. It's been an interesting thing to watch because this has been talked about for a while, hasn't it? It has. Right. And and so I, I, there's an advertisement all the time on TV, and it's uh, the chicken have, uh, that you buy in the store has no antibiotics. Right. And so in some cases, those folks have already taken that out of their rations and, and uh, not a generally applied thing in the poultry business or maybe in the hog business as well. Right, right. So uh, is this... What should, how should consumers feel about this? Should they feel more comfortable, do you think, uh, buying regular meat out of the grocery store? Is it? Uh... Well, I, I think the thing that uh, everybody needs to recognize is that anything that we do to have more oversight of just antibiotic use in general, and um, you know that is a positive benefit for the industry as well as as public health, regardless of whether the theory has been proved or not. Um, and so, you know, that just gives a little extra assuredness to the consumer that there is more control over antibiotic use in the livestock industry. Has, uh, I, I think I know the answer to this, but this is unusual that the FDA is involved. Uh, we're, we're not talking about USDA, we're talking about FDA. Is this unusual that they're uh, going to have a new bureaucracy that we're going to have to deal with? Right. So now the FDA has responsibility of, um, they have oversight of all drugs. And, and so. And have had for a long time. Right, right. And so, um, you know, we could go into a lot of detail of how these changes came to be. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the FDA is going to have the regulatory oversight of it, working with uh, state feed officials to help carry out um, these new 
these new, new rules or new activities. So basically for farmers, our, our uh, first step is to visit with our veterinarian about how this is gonna impact our operation and, and uh, um, establish a relationship with him and with our livestock. Correct, correct. One other thing I think that needs to uh, be discussed is this concept of extra label drug use. An extra label drug use is using a drug um, in a way that it's not labeled for. And forever, as long at least I can remember, uh, extra label drug use of feed additives has not been permissible. Now, people have been using feed grade antibiotics extra label. Uh, some, one common practice, at least in this state, is to use it in the summer for control of pink eye, mm -hmm. or at least CTC or chlorotetracycline. Uh, there is no label indication for control of pink eye or treatment or prevention of pink eye on CTC. So what that means is when this all goes into effect, that a producer can't ask their veterinarian to write a VFD for anything that's not on the label. So and that's not going to be permitted under any circumstances? Correct, correct. Dr. Payne, thank you very much. Yeah. That's all the time we have tonight, but thanks to Dr. Craig Payne for being with us, and to Ryan McDowell and Stan Cook for allowing us to speak with them as well. But that's all the time we have for tonight. Before we go, we'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Egg. Be sure to tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at Camo S and myself, Good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeag at camos.org or find us on Facebook.